uh, a very warm good evening to you though you are not all of you are here um welcome to the fp lecture series 2017 and uh, today we have dr yamni it's a pleasure for us to uh, she's coming from netherlands and uh, delivering a uh, talk on smart mobility is smart mobility also gender smart um dr yamini is an urban and transportation planner and founder of planet consulting based in the netherlands and she has been associated earlier with lee associate and cr planning board and ilfs ideas um she has been uh, um, involved in um, international journals and conferences articles books chapters and etc so I request uh, uh, Dr. Yamini Singh to please come and um, start the lecture. Okay. Thank you. So my presentation will be structured like this. I will first talk about what is gendered mobility because not every one of us know about it. We don't even talk about it. What are the global statistics of the same? Why is it important to know about gendered mobility? Then I, on the second side, I will talk about what is smart mobility. What do I mean by that? why are we talking about smart mobility and what does the existing research say about the mix of two in the end of course there will be inferences and conclusions so let me first start with what is gendered mobility the gendered mobility is actually about the differences between how men and women travel now how do women travel we have seen in our households what happens is that as compared to men women make more trips they don't just make commute trips commute trips basically mean going to the office and coming back that's a typical commute trip but women don't do just that because they're also taking care of the household they're also going to the school they're also going to the groceries they're also taking the elderly to the doctors they're also going for the pta meetings and everything so women are making much more trips than the men and they take they make multiple purpose trips because as i said they are making trips for different purposes not just going to work but a lot of non work trips are made by women they also make shorter trips because if you notice in your households your mother or yourself or your sister who is married or something they would like to go to the closest grocery store they would like to take their kid to the closest school they would like to go to the closest dispensary because all of these trips have to be made within the span of the day that they have at the disposal and they cannot afford to make any longer trips to do all these activities so they typically make shorter trips than men and they also travel mostly in the off peak hours because the peak hours are the times where the most commute trips happen so all the non work trips they happen in the off peak hours and most importantly women depend on low cost means of transport so they will walk they will take a cycle rickshaw they will take an auto rickshaw they will take a bus and they will try to minimize the cost of the travel as much as possible because most of the times they are not the earning members in the family they are taking them the the money is not coming through there they are the ones who are spending the money to carry out all the activities to run the household and this difference this difference between how men and women work uh, sorry travel is actually called gendered mobility but why do we have that difference why do women and men travel differently and the reason is very simple the first is of course the patriarchal societies our societies are such that that women are made responsible for a lot more than men and it's not a case of different but equal responsibilities it is actually a case of unequal burden of responsibilities now i do not want this lecture to have to turn into a very feminist talk that's not my you know aim but this is actually the reason and this is a fact and it is important to know that because that's what is the is the whole reason why we have a gender difference in the mobility and of course also because women have lower employment and incomes because they have lower employment rates they are also uh, made responsible for the non work trips and non work activities that they have to manage during the household and men typically get the first right to the to the most appropriate fastest or most expensive mode of travel now for example if you look up, if you think about us a, a family 
uh, of a lower income group or maybe a lower middle income group, even in the middle income group or even in the higher income group, what could be the most uh, expensive mode of travel for a low income group? Maybe a bike, maybe a scooter, but who gets to drive it first? The man, yes. Or a brother. If there, is a bro if there are two siblings, the brother gets to drive it, the sister doesn't. The husband and wife, the husband gets to drive it, not the wife. And that's why the women are actually dependent on other modes of transport, which are not as efficient, which are not as, um, you know, they don't help them save time or money. And that's why the, the difference is not equal. The, if, the difference is actually an unequal difference of not just the responsibilities, but also the access to the modes of transport. And that is the basis of the gender mobility. Now, if I was to tell you that this trend or this concept of gender mobility is not just a concept for developing countries or the Asian countries. If I was to tell you that this concept is actually not just an Indian or an Asian trend, but it's actually global. It happens everywhere. It happens in the most developed nations and even the most egalitarian societies like the Scandinavia, they have a, a policy on gender equality. And even there, that happens. You know, I was discussing this with my husband the other day. And I said, you know, uh, this kind of gender mobility, this happens also in the developed world. And he was very surprised. But then he said, <laughs> you know, it's like you appear for a test, you get a mark sheet, you get five numbers and you're like, oh my God, I didn't fare well. But then you ask someone else, you know, but that's not the kind of feeling we should all have. Our feeling should not be that five is comparatively good enough. Our feeling should be why are we all not in the area of eight, nine? 10 is perfect, 10 is not achievable. But why are we not there yet? Why is it that all over the world this trend is prevailing? So in the second one, second slide, I would like to take you through the global statistics. What happens worldwide? Like in Germany in 2008, it was found that women drove about 560 million kilometers, but men drove only 1200 million kilometers. It proved that the access to cars for women, even in Germany, in not very old, you know, times, but in 2008, the access to cars was limited. In Turkmenistan, in early 2000s, there was a survey, and then it was found that 20% of the men, but only 7% of the women commuted by car. And women also walked to work twice as much as men. Even in India, we see that women are walking to the work. They're cycling, they're not cycling, but of course, most of them are walking to do as much as they can. In Sweden in 1999, of course, the access to cars was half as that for, women, for men. And in 2006, a study showed that the presence of young children reduced the travel for women, but it had no impact whatsoever on the men. In Sweden, in Norway, 2008, it was found that women have a very limited action, limited space of action, which means that the area that they can cover is much less as compared to the men. The men would travel farther distances, but the women will not. <clears throat> and in all over European region, in 2015, just two years ago, it was found that the percentage of women driving was less than that of men, while it was more for the use of public transport, walking or cycling. Now, I just want to mention one thing. I do not want to say that women should be driving more because driving more is a very unsustainable manner of development. So I do not want to say that everybody should have access to cars, everybody should be driving more. But the point of all this is that there is a difference. And, the, and to close this difference, we don't need higher access to cars, but actually a shift for men also to a public transport or other, or, or other sustainable modes of transport. And the public transport in this case then has to be a very good quality public transport that is not just cost efficient, but is also time efficient. But that's a different area of discussion. This presentation is not about that. So why is it important to talk about gender mobility? So fine, there are differences. So fine, men travel differently. Fine, women just travel differently. They choose other modes of transport. Why do we need to know about it? It's important because by helping women travel more efficiently, we give them higher access to employment. We give them higher access to economic development. 
and education and services and this only leads to the productivity and economic growth of the whole society not just the women but the whole society if women are able to better meet the needs of the household ultimately the basic economic unit that is the household is getting benefited and of course it leads to the economic development of the country as a whole by optimizing the transfer system for all users the costs can be lowered and there are higher economic returns economic rate of return on the infrastructure on the spending that we make on infrastructure when we have more users when we have not just a certain section of the society using it and the other section not benefiting from it so this was basically this part of the presentation was about gendered mobility this was to give you a background on what is gendered mobility but the topic of the of this presentation is is smart mobility also gender smart so i have talked about what is gendered mobility and now i want to discuss is smart mobility doing anything good to close this gap between the in the gender mobility so let's talk about smart mobility do we know what is smart mobility does anybody over here have an idea of what is called smart mobility sorry we can um no it's a, it's a, it's a section i mean sustainable transport is a completely different uh, thing but smart mobility could be a part of sustainable transport or sustainable mobility but Chinese smart mobility Chinese sorry mhm uh huh okay uh huh okay these are small uh, these are usually parts but it's not really uh, what defines mobility as smart of course the use of technology is very important to say like we have smart cities and then we have yeah for example it's it's already started in bangalore we got the where is the traffic mode mhm we got those areas okay 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 then it's it, it's uh, it's the use of technology making transport systems better but in the current scenario when we talk about smart mobility we talk about a gamut of services mobility services that are termed smart if latest technology internet and telecommunication devices are integral to the provision of these services so smart mobility actually if you look if you read around smart mobility refers to certain services that are provided with the help of the telecommunication devices and internet etc this is not a, a a definition per se but this is just to explain what smart mobility has now there are three basic components to smart mobility one is the bike sharing one the other is the car sharing and the third is the services of the uber or ola or something like that and they are called ride sourcing so there are three main service services that come under the gamut of the smart mobility we have bike sharing we have car sharing and we have ride sourcing and all of these services if they are provided through an app based platform then they are counted as smart mobility services now i would want to just spend a couple of minutes asking you all about the smart mobility services and how many of you have used bike sharing anywhere in the world okay and where have you used it in india yeah bhopal bhopal oh okay and there was spain sweden okay okay that's nice to how many half of you have used the car sharing mm -hmm. more hands up this time <laughs> okay and also in india okay which which apps do you use okay so they are car sharing right so you share the ride with sorry no no that's one thing car sharing is something where you share the ride with someone so yeah they also have uh, sharing services so i know about ola also. so that's good and how many of you have used uber ola as i expected <laughs> okay i i used ola myself from to get from the airport to the guest house so i wouldn't say that but which one do you think is most comfortable 
right sourcing car sharing or bike sharing or is it did i say it in the order right sourcing okay and when do you use it what for what kind of purposes do you how many of you have used it for recreation purposes like going out to the party or coming back from it okay and how many of you have used it to you know come for uh, come to college or go to college on a regular basis none only once in a while like you're getting late or something it's it's raining outside that thing okay Mm-hmm. Okay. So it's basically uh, it's a casual use, right? It's not a regular use. Most of you who have used right sourcing or even car sharing, you don't use it on a regular basis. Right? You only use it off and off, on and off, whenever you need one. Okay. That's good to know. And why do you use it? How many how many of you feel that right sourcing is the safest form of the smart mobility? No. Uh huh. <coughs> mm hmm. Okay. Do you use it because it's uh, cheaper? Cheaper than? The... Okay. That's good. Mm hmm. So it's comfortable and it's cost efficient and yes. Okay, so you use it because it's sustainable. Okay. Like trip chaining. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's not possible. Ah ha ha. Okay. Okay. So you have the time to yourself, and you don't have to drive. So the 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 hassle of driving is taken away when you are not doing it yourself. Even in a car sharing, I think that would be the reason. But bike sharing, of course, you have to drive. Yeah. <laughs> you can't get out of it. Okay. That's very nice to know because I wanted to get uh, the Indian perspective on this. and i do of course a lot of my audience is women so i do see a lot of women <laughs> the women hands up <laughs> but it's good to know that the women are also doing uh, the the girls sorry are also <laughs> doing bike sharing and car sharing and and the uber that's good so that's what the smart mobility that's what smart mobility is about now why are we talking about smart mobility why am i trying to con to connect Gender smart and smart mobility. I could connect gender smart with anything, but why am I talking about smart mobility? So there are two things to it. I'll first give you the background to smart mobility, and then then I tell you what has been the growth of smart mobility, which has been stupendous. Let me give you a bit of a background. Now, can you see it? Can you read it? Okay. So, in the uh, uh, what I would like to say is that improving mobility of women. as i've already said is not about giving higher access to of uh, to cars to them but it's actually about modal shift of men also to shift from the cars to the more sustainable modes now bike sharing and car sharing are more sustainable modes of uh, travel but right sourcing is not because right sourcing is a simple taxi service taxi like service and uh, it's not reducing the use of cars You, if you, if if you are taking a right uh, you know uber or an ola you're still using cars to complete your trip and it's not the most sustainable way but bike sharing and car sharing are sustainable modes of transport so if bike sharing and car sharing are encouraged and are promoted and are received well by the people then we are shift we are able to create a shift even for the men and women both to go from cars to sharing mechanisms now and smart mobility provides like i said both sustainable and unsustainable ways of travel and in the last decades like uh, last decade smart mobility has disrupted the mobility scene and has changed the way people move and has taken excellent advantage of the latest technology that is the smartphones that we have now everybody has a smartphone everybody has a super computer in their pocket and everybody is taking a good advantage of it and the providers of these services have detected this this market and has provided the user with a very good service that everybody wanted and people are actually lapping it up now 
some of these services like bike sharing or something they they could be less comfortable than private transport but are much more cost efficient and some of them provide higher flexibility and access than rigid and fixed public transport systems so these uh, the smart mobility services fall somewhere in between the private sector the private transport is most comfortable but least cost efficient the public transport is least comfortable but most cost efficient and these services actually fall somewhere in between they are less comfortable than the private transport but more comfortable than the public transport they are some somewhat more cost efficient than the private transport but less but less cost efficient from the public transport so these services fall somewhere in mid, in, in between and experts opine that they have they say that these services are actually providing higher access to mobility to more economically vulnerable sections of the society including women so the experts say okay it's a very good system we have sharing mechanisms we have cars and cycles to be shared and women and other uh, you know economically weaker sections of the society who cannot afford to own their own own cars or own bikes or something they can they can you know use these systems so in theory it actually should provide higher access to these vulnerable sections of the society now the growth of the smart mobility has been huge in the last decade in a study of 2014 it says that it the study was done by roland burgess and it said that within the shared economy it could be about you know in the shared economy you just don't not just have shared vehicles but you also have shared houses you have shared services you have shared parking services so all of these in the shared economy this sector is the fastest growing in terms of revenue it records 20 to 30% growth per annum it's a lot and by 2025 this sector is actually expected to be worth 30 billion euros and it is very fascinating to know that uber just just uber has a had a value of 18 billion us dollars in 2014 so you can just imagine that in the growth of the smart mobility a large section of this growth is actually in the right sourcing section not as much in bike sharing or in car sharing a lot of the revenue is actually a lot of growth is in the right sourcing uber of course it also has car sharing but in terms of revenue i think it's generating more revenue from the right sourcing and not to car sharing and in 2010 that was about 7 years ago 1.2 million members were sharing 31000 cars in 26 countries and in 2015 980 cities around the world had implemented bike sharing systems so we have a growth in bike sharing and car sharing also and the reasons why they have been growing so well is that the availability of auto mobility has increased because of the access to it and these businesses are very asset light businesses because uber and ola and all, and the, uh, they don't own any cars they simply provide the connection between the users and the owners and they just give a platform so the growth has been phenomenal because there is little investment in terms of investing into the asset and there is high revenue uh, high, high revenue and of course because like some of you said you know it takes away the hassle of driving so people are also aware that if they drive there is congestion then they have to look for a parking spot and all of this hassle is taken away when you actually get into a sharing system or into a right sourcing system so people are actually taking these services for their comfort it provides them better comfort and because of course because of the smartphones and the technology sharing has never been more convenient and it has never been cheaper than owning but now it is cheaper than owning because we have a lot of supply so this is a this is a background that is why it's important to discuss smart mobility because the sector is huge the growth has been huge and now it is disrupting the mobility sector it is the in thing people are talking about it they are using it and we don't know if they have actually done anything to close the gap in the gender mobility because the concept of gender mobility has been around since decades and decades and people are trying the policy makers are trying to close the gap to provide higher access to good transport services not just to men but also to women and then this sector comes along and yet we don't know if it is doing anything to close that gap so what i did was there was the, whatever existing research that has been done in the sector of smart mobility i dug it up i studied it and saw i tried to understand if we know 
if smart mobility has done anything to close the gap in the gender mobility. So this is just a gist, a, a little gist of a lot of studies that have been done. One conclusion is that most of the studies for bike sharing, car sharing and ride sourcing has been done in North America and some in Europe. But otherwise, other than that, there is, there is not much work to research on how has smart mobility affected anything, not just gender, but anything at all. Most of the studies are in the North America. So for the bike sharing, of course, like I said, the area that has been, the, uh, the, in North America and Europe only, there have been studies about how has bike sharing affected the relationship between the, with the public transport, as in, are the users of bike sharing competing with the public transport? In the sense, are they moving from public transport to bike sharing? Because then that's a move from one sustainable mode to another sustainable mode. You know, but then it's important to understand. And the other, so, uh, other question or the other point of investigation is, who are these users? Who is using bike sharing? And the main conclusion of these studies is that, first, it complements public transport. So people are actually using uh, bike sharing at the bus stops or, the, or at the transit stops. So they are probably taking a metro or something, reaching a bike, uh, uh, a bike station, they're picking up a bike, going to the destination and doing it on the return also. So it's complementing the bus system, complementing the transit system, it's not competing it against it. But for smaller cities, of course, it says that it has replaced transit trips as it is cheaper and faster. Because if you're in a small city, you don't need to follow the fixed routes of the public transport that goes you know, in a ring, when you go, when you need to actually, you know, just go from point A to B, you don't need to take the bus to go through the circles. So it's in smaller cities, it makes more sense to have bike sharing rather than the transit. And the bike sharing members tend to be wealthier, more educated, younger, more Caucasian, and more male. It's very counterintuitive. I was looking for, 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 more, for more women, you know, <laughs> but I didn't see that even in the bike sharing, but what I, what I also find interesting is that they tend to be wealthier. They're so they are suited and booted and they are taking their bikes and you know, maybe the weather is uh, good enough for them to go for their meetings or something. But that's the result of the, that's the conclusion of the study. And women are mostly casual users. Like, you know, I understand from this small survey that I did, women or anybody actually has been a very casual user, uh, user of the bike sharing or car sharing or even ride sourcing. And the users of shared mode drive less and walk more. So basically the ones who are using the bike sharing are eventually driving less and walking more and biking more and so they are becoming more sustainable in the patterns of movement. Now similarly for the car sharing, of course a lot of studies again have been done in North America and Europe. Europe meaning only Germany, I had to say Europe, but there is actually not much work outside Germany. And again there, the questions of investigation or questions of research have been, what has been the impact on vehicle ownership? Have people stopped buying cars because they can use car sharing and carry on their trips in the comfort of the car without actually owning one? Because in countries like North America and Europe, you have to pay taxes, monthly taxes. Even if you're not driving your car, you have taxes, you have parking charges, and it doesn't matter if you own a car, just and you put it in the garage. So it is possibly cheaper not to own the car and use the car sharing services just when you need it. What has been the impact on environment? Like we all know that car sharing and bike sharing, and bike sharing they are the sustainable modes of transport. Right? This is they are sustainable systems. So it, this. Investigation was to prove it. Has it had any effect on the environment? Has car sharing made any sustainable, has met any sustainable goals? And again, what is the relationship with the public transit? Is it competing or is it complementing? And who are the users? The main conclusion from all these studies was that first, it is a cheaper alternative to owning a car. Fine, that's done. And one shared car may lead to a reduction of four to over 20 owned cars. So it means that people are actually giving up vehicle ownership and using car sharing because they prefer it other, that way. And one shared car may lead to 11 cars less on the roads. Now this fact is actually different than the fact above because that's about vehicle ownership and this is about vehicle use. 
so even though a car a shared car is actually uh, reducing about 4 to 20 owned cars it is actually rem uh, removing about 11 cars from the roads and that's huge and that is also converted into 44% reduction in the pmt on an average per user look at the co2 emissions in the range of 142 to 312 kg per person per year that's the effect of car sharing and that is sustainable so they have a proof what else do they find out that it complements public transport which is nice to know then again users they are likely to be caucasian male between the age of 20 and 35 and well educated women again are mostly casual users but higher educated and good income because car sharing i think is slightly more expensive slightly more expensive than the bike sharing program so only the women who have higher incomes and higher education are the ones who are using the bike uh, the car sharing and the respondents did not report traveling with children not did they report part time employment because women with women it's not always a full time employment men are usually always full time employed full time but women in developed nations they can actually choose for part time employment a lot of working women are part time employed so that they can take care of not just uh, you know the work but also their households and carry out all the non work activities so all the respondents who were using car sharing most of them were not part time employed they were full time now for the right sourcing again the studies have been only in north america and the questions have been it's because, uh, what has been the impact of vehicle ownership again what is its relationship with transit impact on environment and who are the users and the main <coughs> conclusions are that they are mostly frequently most frequently used for social trips like you said you know i asked a question how many of you use it for recreation purposes going to a party or coming back or going to a destination to have fun you know not just a commute trip not a work trip but for the recreation purposes and that's what the right sourcing are usually used for and more than half of the right sourcing trips were actually replacing transit walk bike and all car trips they were replacing everything they were, they are competing with everything they are not complementing anything they are really unsustainable users are younger more educated their the environmental impacts are currently under study for like at the university of berkeley they are doing a massive study on to understand what has been their environmental impact and the transit agency they are scared like you know the the uh, the dallas uh, area rapid transit and the other american cities they are very scared of the fact that people are reusing right sourcing so much and they are sh they are they are fearful that their transit patronage is going to go down even more so what they are trying is trying to do is they are trying to team up with uber so whenever you pick up a you try to book a ride with uber the uber gives you an option you know that you take your cab to this bus stop or this metro station and then you take uh, this hall of the trip through public transport then you take uber so it tries to change you know itself with the public transport but that's only for one city and that's also under trial it has been very recently started so there is not much to conclude from there i think it was in dallas but i'm not sure there were a couple of cities around the same area i think it was dallas so what we understand from this research is that now i'm going to come to the inferences and then what do we infer from this firstly there is no research specific to how it is affecting the gender there is no work whatsoever there is like when i when i specified what have been the areas of investigation i wanted to know has any study worked on does it, does anybody even think about the question you know is it doing anything to close the gap in the gender mobility but that's not the question that has come in anybody's mind as of now and people are still you know, working on different questions Now let me just match what have been our conclusions from the gender mobility and what have been our conclusions from the smart mobility. The conclusion from the gender mobility is that women travel with children or elderly. They choose cheaper modes of transport. They have lower incomes and they do not drive as much as men, right? But what have been our conclusions from the smart mobility? Almost no respondents travel with the children. They are not women. Bike and car sharing are cheaper. but not right sourcing 
but when we look at the uses of bike and car sharing they are also mainly male bike and car sharing are not convenient for traveling with kids that was also one of the conclusions from a study in germany which was about car sharing and you would expect that a woman could travel with the children in a car sharing at least but even that study found that it was not very comfortable for women and bike sharing is definitely out of question because you cannot carry your kids with a bike you need to carry a carrier for your kids to be carried on the bike unless you are just traveling with one child with one child and they have a, car, a child seat on the bike but that was a rare phenomena then the uses of higher income but women have lower incomes on general in general and they have replaced car trips now we all know that women drive less so if it has replaced car trips most of them are coming from men so it, not many women are taking drive per se and users are mainly male that's a direct survey of the demographics of the users and it says that the most of the users are male they are not female because there is no direct study to connect the gendered mobility and smart mobility these are only the inferences that we can make out of the conclusions that we have found and that brings me to the conclusion our conclusions <laughs> and that is first thing is that gender mobility is not a mainstream subject and the reason why i decided to give a lecture on this is that none of us really know what is gender mobility when we are in college even when we graduate we start working unless you are working on a project which talks about gender mobility you will not know what is gender mobility and it is very important for future planners to be aware and be sensitive to the needs of the women and men both i should not say just women but they should be sensitive to the travel needs of not just men but also women so when we plan our cities when we plan our transport systems we must know what to do and let and not just work towards providing the transportation systems to uh, you know to work for the work trips that's what our transportation uh, transportation systems you know the planning of the transport systems is so heavily bent towards satisfying the needs of the work trips so the commute trips you know so the the roads will be designed oh peak traffic kitna hai itni chaudi road bana do oh itna peak traffic hai chalo uske jo peak traffic hota hai that is all work trips so our public transport usage our road the width of the roads the flyover everything is worked around that but nobody works and nobody thinks about the non work trips that the women are making in the off peak hours how are they walking how are they taking public transport how are they going to do the groceries to the school the dentist and everything none of none of us are really thinking on those lines and working for the benefit of the women and how they are carrying out the household work one more conclusion that out of this was that even though more women are becoming bread winners but they are still stuck in the sectors of low wages where they are which requires less travel so that their space of action is limited they do not commute to larger distances to work they get employed in the low skill sector and which of course then leads to lack of benefits and this leads this make the whole cycle you have less uh, you have lower employment you have lower incomes you have lower access you have less money to spend on the transport so there is a limited space of action then you have to choose you know there is a trade off which kind of employment you choose so it's a whole cycle it feeds into itself we need to break that cycle and as i said solution is not to provide improved access to cars because that is unsustainable we need to look at providing a shift in men's travel patterns also to more transit use and walking that is more sustainable we don't need to move women from public transport and walking to cars yaar sab log gaadi chalao aisa nahi kar sakte hum log we have to move people from cars to public transport and thus it is very important to examine how smart mobility has has impacted or has the potential of impacting the access safety ease or comfort of mobility for women most research focuses on impact on environment transit ridership vehicle ownership these are valid questions i'm not saying they are wrong questions they shouldn't investigate of course they are good questions of course you want to know what, how are they how is smart mobility affecting the environment and the people in general but there is also a dire need to understand how it is affecting the gender mobility and nobody is doing that because not many people are aware of this concept called gender mobility 
and the reason why I thought that this is a good platform to present this is because you are all going to be researching something in your MSc thesis, in your PhD thesis if you if you take PhD, in any of your thesis and this is a very good area of research. You could take up different case studies, you could, you know, under, you, you, when you study you will talk about it in your classes with your fellow planners and when you go forward you will have this knowledge and that's how we can propagate the you know, understanding of gender mobility and how it is important, why it is important. And maybe some of the research that you do could be also helpful, helpful in forming policy to improve the access, you know, for women. So that's the whole idea of it. So, like I said, the policy must ensure that the gender gap does not widen. It has to close and that's why we need more research in this area. That was all. So, thank you. Uh, so, uh, we can start the questions, uh, doubt session, whatever you want. So, my question is uh, not exactly related to class mobility, but also to gender mobility. It's about gender patients, we need public transport. We have a coach in Delhi Metro and ladies' special buses and so on. So, what how does it women classes? Okay. Yeah, I was talking to this uh, wonderful lady before the <laughs> lecture and we were discussing about the same thing. And I told her that also, which I'm going to tell you. I think it's not wrong and I think it's only helping women travel more, uh, travel better. Like it's affecting the comfort of the, of the women who are traveling. And that I think is a step towards closing the gender gap, you know. Like there was a study in Vienna in 1999. And uh, there was uh, the survey was about how do women travel in the cities, and uh, they found out that again that the women were walking, they were taking more public transport, and things. And they decided, even in Vienna, they decided to have some seats reserved only for women because women are traveling with children, they are sometimes traveling also with elderly, they are sometimes carrying groceries, and these kind of things. When, when, uh, when you reserve some seats for women, it's only helping them, making their com their travel com more comfortable. Even in Germany, they have uh, special places in the buses and in metros, which are reserved for women, so that women are encouraged to use public transport. They don't, they, like I said, we don't need to ship women from public transport to cars. Ne, yeah, public transport ne kaun jayega, kaun khada hoga bas ne, you know? If you give them seats, like in metro, because they have a whole coach that is reserved for women, more women are now encouraged to take metro. Like, ha, okay, we'll go to ladies' coach. Mein chale jayenge. Kitni bhi bheed ho, it doesn't matter. It's more comfortable for them. And they don't have to worry about e-teasing. They don't have to worry about the safety or security. And it, it's just helping them. So why not? It's, I think it's helping. Maybe they can also hear you then. And uh, uh, in that stat, it stated that with one car sharing, it uh, you know reduces 11 cars on the road. Yeah. So uh, what I uh, what my doubt was that with one car sharing, a car is mostly houses five people. Yeah. So with one car sharing, it may reduce four other cars. How mm -hmm. is it that it reduces 11 cars altogether? Because the same car is making more trips through the day. So it's going in one direction, it's coming back. Now, on an average, I would, uh, you know, the study has uh, uh, studied how many trips is one shared car making. And it's not always that it is fully um, shared. So maybe in, uh, if it is making about six trips in a day, short short trips or some long, some short, one of the times it has only two people. Just generic. Yes, yes. So it is, it is able to remove 11 cars. It means that on an average, 11 people are using it in a day. You know, I think that's what it means. Every car is replacing 11 used, uh, 11 users, uh, used cars to car trip. That's how. Hello. So, ma'am, my point was actually like, how much do you think this uh, uh, collaboration of transit with Uber will mm -hmm. work? Because mostly what we've studied till now is why people prefer. Uh, 
private transport over public transport is because of the end mile connectivity mm-hmm. so what do you think that will it actually work if because in the end we are at connectivity we want yeah. an end mile connectivity from one place to other place yeah so what do you think will it actually affect the transit hmm it's it's difficult to say firstly because it's happening in a city i have never been to so i don't know what what the preferences of the people are what i think is that preliminary uh, uh idea is what like if they have gotten into a partnership they are definitely looking to get some benefit out of it it's so they are hopeful they are definitely hopeful that this is going to help what they are trying to th- uh, their uh, direction of thinking is that instead of a person taking uber from point a to b let's make uber uh, you know let's work with uber so that the person is taken from a to b b to c c to d you know so in and in the in the main hall if they are taking public transport then it is taking a lot of uh, miles away from the uber but what has uber to gain out of it that's also another question so i haven't gone into the details of this partnership of how it's working but i do know that the app that uber has they are making some changes to suggest to the user that there is a connection by public transport at this time so at the time of leaving they can give the suge- the, the user a suggestion that if you leave now you can also go you can also take public transport from this point to this point and from there onwards again they will have a uber connection for the first mile connectivity and the last mile connectivity so that's one of the models that they are doing in fact even in finland they have they are creating a, a an app uh, i think it's called vim or something like that that provides the user with the whole connection you know like if you just have to put your origin and destination and it will give you the the trip with all chains so kahan pe bike share karni hai kahan pe car share kar sakte ho kahan pe public transit le sakte ho wo puri trip bana ke aapko deta hai so that's also very nice Mm-hmm. Uh, what more can be done to foster smartness uh, in gender mobility mm, as in how to make it more smart yeah mm. but in gender mobility how can we foster smartness how can we increase smartness in terms of gender mobility okay i uh, can i say that how can smart mobility actually help in gender mobility Is, can we also say that okay well um I think first thing that we what we understand from this is that women are not using most of these services either they are not cost efficient or they are not women friendly in the sense they cannot travel with the children or with the elderly so only the single women who are traveling on their own you know maybe for work or for leisure only they are the people who are using these kind of services so i think these are the two main sectors that the smart mobility has to work on they have to come up with something such that it becomes a cost efficient model for women and uh it it doesn't it shouldn't just cater to single travelers so they have to come up with something in which women with children women with elderly are also able to use car sharing or bike sharing because i believe both men and women have equal access to smartphones yes. like gender specific but even even there i think they're mistaken like there has been a research and says that even in sweden in 2016 there was a paper and it says that a study on smart mobility assumes that men and women have equal access to digital platforms but it's actually not so like as i said men have the first access to a more expensive mode of travel similarly in households men have the first access to the smartphones that the family can afford so if you look at the lower income groups you will find out you will find that not all women have smartphone because it you also have to be digitally literate and not all women are digitally literate in smaller in in lower income groups you will find that that kind of literacy prevails with the men who have been to schools who have who have the ability to read and that's where the uh, we believe that the access to smart mobility is equal for all but actually it's not so it's not so but that also affects gender mobility and for that i think we need other kind of policy measures we don't have to i mean maybe maybe we can make our uh, system even more smarter to work for the uh, for the non uh, for the digitally illiterate people maybe but then that's a that's an option that will take a long time thank you 
thanks, Yami. I think this is uh, really wonderful, the fact that uh, you have looked at two different thematic areas, mm -hmm. research thematic areas, and uh, just your questions somewhere in between. And mm -hmm. also, identify the research gap between gender mobility and smart mobility. I think the kind of questions you've raised are very important, and uh, maybe it would be a good clue for those of the students who want to take their, uh, you know, as they are deciding on their yeah, topics yeah. in which mm -hmm. direction. I just one suggestion. Uh, have you tried looking at, uh, you know, MIT lab has opened up the Uber data. Uh -huh, I know about that. I think that's what they're calling it. And okay. They opened up the Uber data. Uh -huh. So at least with one of the verticals in the smart mobility, you mm -hmm. would be able to see. It would be interesting to see empirically, mm -hmm. even if it's in an American city context, yeah. how gendered is the smart mobility in, the, in, in this whole sector of. Yeah. The, the what you call the source right, right? Yeah, right sourcing. Right okay. Yeah. So I think that's the suggestion. Maybe if you want yeah. to take your research forward from mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. I do. Empirical data would probably be available on that website. Okay, that's that's a good suggestion. And uh, the second was actually a question that I had. Yeah. Uh, the research gap that you mentioned, mm -hmm. that's something that North American cities actually suffer from low patronage because their public transport systems are not as good as their European yes. systems. So, a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, some of the reasons for North America would also hold true for developing countries like India. Now, the only difference I would say is that the Indian public transport, uh, public transport systems are already running on high patronage. People are taking buses, but although, uh, I mean, in India, especially in Asian countries and all over the world also, a, a car is a symbol of uh, societal status. It's a symbol of uh, progression in your economy, in your financial status. So uh, that has also something to do with the popularity of ride sourcing and uh, car sharing. Like if you travel in the car, you, okay, you are, you know, better off in the bike uh, person. So that is also one of the reasons. But uh, to uh, but I like I said most of the studies are having done in North America in Europe very handful very handful so I would not expect mm -hmm. uh, a big difference between the results uh, there yeah I I think so. Um, no, I just want to ask uh, not a question but just my curiosity um, that you want to say that that if you don't have a smart mobility let's forget that that, that you have a digital kind of thing. Hmm. So in that case, like before 90s or uh, 2000, when we don't have this, uh, this platform, yeah. you say that the women are suffering because they have to travel a lot by the public mm -hmm. trans public system and then <coughs> are traveling by car. But on the other side, when you are saying that you have this digital platform, like mm -hmm. their women are also not on the on the lower side of the be the benefits are not so. Uh, yeah, uniformly uh, uh, reached to them. Yeah. So, I mean, my uh, what I'm trying to understand from this. So, what could be the best thing for them? Because the public is, public transportation is not very good for. I mean, uh, it's a compulsion for them actually mm -hmm. because the car is always with the husband, mm -hmm. right? And on the other side, when the the people who were using the car earlier now, mm -hmm. because because you are saying the higher educated and in, so these, that means that that those people who are using car now they have been shifted to this um, the uh, bike sharing and the car sharing yeah. and mm -hmm. and that means the women are remain what they were right mm -hmm. means, so there is no uh, there is no change really change right is happening. yeah that, but so so, that, so where this woman like you know the the uh, are they located? I mean, that is what is my mm. yeah. I, it's a good, it's a good point you've raised, but that's also the conclusion that we made that 
we expected smart mobility at least the experts were saying that the smart mobility is has, has given higher access to the socially vulnerable groups even the women they have uh, they have provided a more accessible platform and yet we find in the conclusions that most of the users are not women so there is a there is still a reason and like i was telling her also that First is of course, are they uh, are they user friendly to the women? Are they able to travel with their kids? Are they able to travel with the groceries on the bike sharing or the cars or the car sharing or the ride sourcing? Are they cost efficient? These systems, uh, what I understand from here is that these systems are either not user friendly or they are not cost efficient for the women to, to be chosen, which is why only uh, those women who have uh, a full full time employment, higher incomes, or uh, you know, higher education, they are the ones who are able to afford them and so they are using it and they are user friendly for them because they are traveling, traveling just like men. They are not traveling with the typical characteristics of the women, they are traveling like men. So these systems, they seem to be still user friendly to men, not to women, which is why these systems are not, um, you know, what should I say, and accepted and used so much by women. And <laughs> yes, it, yes, and in your uh, in Europe also the same divide exists. It's only the level. I mean, the percentages would differ. Thank you for your very interesting. Thank you. Uh, I'm a first year in Rajvi School here in Planning. Okay. And uh, my question is. Uh, I think it started off with this phase, uh, patriarchal society. Yeah. And since then, we've been talking about one man traveling, like mm -hmm. men traveling, mm -hmm. and there's women traveling, mm -hmm. and then there's this family youth. Uh -huh. that's been traveling, that's okay. Traveling, women with children. Yeah. So, uh, and our, all our planning theories when we be always focusing on either the men mm -hmm. moving around the yeah. family. Yeah. Like, there's never really been this idea of women, women with the yeah. women traveling alone in the city. Yeah. And so is it like the whole cost efficiency and all the smartness, is it like in essence, essentially isn't it just possibly because of new traveling alone, safety and so forth, the efficiency of the economic value that transport is there? Yeah. See, uh, what happens is that in our planning system, I agree, there is. And that the thing is that our planning systems have not been uh, openly, what should I say, gender insensitive. They don't say we are planning for men. They're planning for work trips. And then who takes the work trips? Mostly men. I'm not saying women don't make work trips. Of course they do. And with the with the change in time, more women are becoming, as I said, there are more women are earning. They are more, uh, they are becoming bread winners of the family. But they are still like, you know, in the in our patriarchal societies, the women have assumed men's role, but the men have not assumed women's role. They have not shared. You know, so more women are doing what men do. But their their household work is not taken or shared enough by the men. So that that that, that patriarchy did exist, and uh, that change is not happening. Which means that the women of today are actually burdened with more. They have to work. They like to work because it is their identity, and I'm I'm seeing it's perfectly fine. They should be doing it, but at the same time, their their work at home is not getting shared. So they are still responsible for the things that are happening. So, and even in the most developed societies. Where they don't have maids, they don't have servants to help. So, so the women are leaving very early. They're dropping the kids to the school because in many of the countries, like in Netherlands, where I live, they don't have school buses. So the kids need to be dropped to the school. Then they go to work. And most of the women are employed half-time. So they come back from work. They cook lunch. They get the kids from the school. They feed them. And then they prepare for the dinner, which is 6 o'clock. The husband comes. They eat. And then she, the the wife is cleaning the kitchen, putting the kids to bed, then getting uh, ready for the next day. And, you know, this is what typically happens. Of course, there you can see some men are sharing the workload at home, but not the kind, you know, like taking the kids for swimming, taking the kids for PTA, taking the, ki uh, taking the kids to school or bringing them back. These are typically the activities the women of the household are doing it. They will help around in the kitchen. They will help around with the laundry. But the trips that the women have to make, they still have to make them. So, of course, I mean, with, it is, like you said, you know, the cost efficiency and everything. It's, the difference is... Okay. 
Thank you very much, and uh, I ask. Uh, so uh, thank you so much, Shami. It's a wonderful present, very insightful. Thank you. Um, it has opened our eyes towards global north. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. thank you so much. And thank you for coming. Yeah, I think uh, you just raised a very important. Uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation. I know it's your recent uh, research that you're yeah. working on in Europe. I think the kind of questions which have been raised are very important. Mm -hmm. Two thematic areas. One is about the smart mobility, the other is about the gender mobility. And how do the two talk to each other at all? They're very relevant, they're integrated, yeah. but at the moment, is the literature and research under the, uh, the two areas really talking to each other? Yeah. And uh, of course, Yamini raises more questions than she has answered. Mm -hmm. But it's a very important and pertinent question for all of us. And I know for, for sure I would be probably looking for further research in this, yeah, in this area which tries to sort of bridge the gap between the two yeah. areas. And I think the beginning could be, as I said, some empirical studies, yes, including yes. Uber, because that's one area where a lot of data has been now made open. But only for only for a few cities like in America and after a lot of fight because uh, Uber is not interested in sharing data. It's a private organization. But what we can definitely think of is a very detailed primary survey in the sense so involving I more respondents. Now I'm looking at it on, on the MIT lab, you know, they mm -hmm. have this sense table data mm -hmm. in which Uber has made open the There's, American city. Yeah, data. okay. So at least from some sector, like mm -hmm. as you say, the right sourcing sector, yeah. and how gendered or how uh, sort of sensitive yeah. it is to the gender mobility, maybe something like that yes, can yes. be added to sort of, you know, try to, to make an attempt to sort of bridge the gap between yes. the two uh, thematic areas, I yeah. think. It's also an important uh, juncture at which we have this lecture because as you move towards your thesis, maybe the second year, it's an important. I mean, these are some uh, research questions which are ready for you already, <laughs> which you can probably attempt to answer in the, in the context of India. Yeah. Maybe we can have very very different sort of uh, findings in the empirical context. Yeah. yeah. So I think uh, with that, thank you very much. Thank Yamini you. Thank you very uh, much for this opportunity. Thank, thank you all for coming. Thank you.